Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are getting started live. Going to give folks a few minutes to show up. This is the last tour of Venthaven Museum. If that's what you're here for, you've come to the right place. So uh, we're on a few minutes early. We're going to hang and wait for folks to show up. And uh, we'll be with you momentarily. But if you're looking for the live tour of uh, Venthaven Museum, the last tour, this is going to be it. So stand by. We'll be back in a moment. So if you're just joining us, this is the place to be. This is the live tour of Venthaven Museum. Uh, I will be with you on screen in just a moment. We've got a bunch of people here so far. My goodness. So we'll join you in just one moment. Wow, I got to tell you, people are piling up here. It's about 6 o'clock. We're going to get going in about 30 seconds. Well, hey there, folks. Al Gettler here. It is a little after six o'clock here, Eastern Time. I'm coming to you from South Hero, Vermont, on Lake Champlain in the Champlain Islands. But that's not why you're here to see me sitting here talking to you. You are here because tonight is the last tour of Vent Haven as we know it. There are a ton of people out there with us tonight. Let me just say hello to a few folks. Adam Walker is here from the UK. Hi, Adam. Peter Valentin is here from Australia. Hi, Peter. Uh, we've got a Facebook user. My first time where I can point out to you that if you don't give StreamYard permission, uh, you will not be able to have your um, hellos up there on the screen. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, we have with us uh, Randall Sandy Checker Lee. How are you? Hello, hello. Uh, another Facebook user says, ready. Karen Olson is here. Howdy from West Winchester, Virginia. Uh, another person, here we go. Yes, that's true. Hi, Ann Seaton. Always one of my favorites to show up at my live streams. Chuck Field. Hey, Chuck, I called you. Uh, <laughs> Frank Logan is here. Hi, Frank. Good evening. Uh, we have another Facebook user watching. Give uh, give folks a, a chance to uh, um, uh, see your name by, by taking that. So please go ahead and say yes to StreamYard when it comes to uh, having a show. So first of all, I want to join. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Al Gettler. I am your host tonight, uh, along with um, the folks at Vent Haven Museum, one person in particular that will be on screen in a minute. Uh, for those of you that are joining us that don't know about ventriloquism, I am a ventriloquist and I am someone that performs ventriloquism, have since the age of eight. What you are about to see, where you're about to go is probably one of the most important places in my life. So without any further ado, having me uh, Joining me here on screen from Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, in front of our Venthaven Museum as we know it today, here she is, our curator, Lisa Sweezy. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Al. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Al, I really appreciate you 
uh, doing all the tech stuff for this to make this tour happen. So no thank you problem. so much. No problem. At can't hear him. I can't hear him. Did I lose Al on audio? Mm -hmm. Let me get a few folks here to say hello, uh, everybody. There we go. Uh, so uh, with not without some problems, right? Uh, Linda is here. Hi, Linda. I'm on a friend's computer. This is uh, the Linda Schubert's Facebook page. Uh, we have Doreen Schofield from Atlanta. Tin Tin is here. We have uh, Peter Valentin again uh, saying hello. Farewell to <laughs> the W.S. Burgers Garage. Uh, Rich Sheets is here. Um, tell Cecil I say hi. That's nice. Someone says a low level of, uh, if there's any other problems with low levels of audio, let me know in the comments. David Pierce is here. Ann Seaton. Yes, one last uh, for the old. That's correct. Uh, and uh, Terry Hay is here from Gaylord, Michigan. Uh, oh, Linda Schubert. Uh, uh, this is <laughs> this is Dale Brown. How do I ask my question? We'll come back to you, Dale. Hello from Ohio. Uh, and uh, again, and again. So, Lisa, we're caught up on our comments. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, and I appreciate everybody being here uh, to join me for this. I hope I don't get too emotional during it. On our end, I, there's going to be me giving the tour, and then uh, the lovely and talented Annie B. Roberts is running camera. There she is waving. And then my husband over here on tech support. Get a shot there of Brian, Annie. There he is on tech support. Yay! So making sure everything goes smoothly on our end. You're muted. I'm muted? Al's muted. Oh, Al is We're muted. We're going to ask you some questions tonight, Lisa, from some folks. Okay. You, you, you have given us the top 10 uh, uh, questions from the tours. And I yes. thought before we get started, I just would show folks kind of what that looks like. Okay. So for those of you who have never been to Van Haven, uh, you're about to see it in a few minutes. Um, people often ask Lisa one particular question. So let me pay, play one of those questions right now. But Lisa, aren't you creeped up by these things? <laughs> So that is Austin Phillips, who is a professional ventriloquist figure maker, puppet maker, dummy maker, Phillips Puppets. Uh, he's one of our board of advisor members. We'll play that again when you get inside. But I wanted to show folks that is what you can expect tonight from some of our celebrity question ask, askers. I don't know if that's a word. You're the school teachers on that end. But that being said, we also want questions from the audience. I'll be monitoring those. I am going to step back right now and turn it over to you, Lisa with Annie as your camera person and Brian as your tech person. I'll keep an eye on the questions. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the official last tour of Van Taven Museum as we know it. Take it away, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you again so much for being here tonight. Al, thank you as always for all the tech that you do uh, to help Van Haven. And I'm appreciative of all of you for being here tonight for the very last tour. I'm gonna make this as close to a real tour as possible, although I know a lot of you know plenty about ventriloquism and plenty about Vent Haven. I'm trying to create a historical record here of what it was like to take a tour in 2021. So a typical tour starts out here on the driveway where I talk about Mr. Berger. So let me give you some background. Vent Haven started as a personal collection that belonged to W.S. Berger who lived from 1878 to 1972. He was not a professional ventriloquist at all, but a hobbyist who just loved, loved, loved collecting anything and everything having to do with ventriloquism. He actually worked for a company in Cincinnati called the Cambridge Tile Manufacturing Company. He started there in the mailroom when he was a teenager, and he retired as president of the company in 1947. Uh, Mr. Berger grew up around live theater. His dad was a stage actor, and that's actually where he got his name. W.S. Berger is really William Shakespeare Berger. And so I think that one of the reasons that he became so interested in ventriloquism specifically is that he grew up backstage while his dad would be performing. He got his first little dummy in 1910 when he was on a business trip in New York and brought it home to his wife, who I'm sure was just, you know, thrilled that he was bringing her something from New York, but it wasn't quite in a Tiffany's box. So uh, and then 10 years or 20 years later, 22 years later, he bought four more dummies. So we count the collecting as starting in earnest in 1932. From 1932 until he died in 1972, he was so passionate about this collecting. He wrote and received letters to thousands and thousands of people and businesses in order to build this amazing collection. 
1947, he had amassed about 100 dummies and was retiring from his job at the same time. So I'm sure you can imagine how his wife felt that three of the four bedrooms were filled with dummies as well as the dining room. <laughs> so he sells his car because he doesn't need it to go to work any, anymore. And his wife's like, hey, this is my big chance. Get your stuff out of the house and put it in the garage. So that's where we're going to start the tour tonight is where Mr. Berger started exhibiting the collection to the public around 1947. This building was a one car garage that he put this frontispiece on and the side room and extended it out the back a bit. And he brought the dummies out here and started calling it Vent Haven Museum around 1947. The collection though was exploding. And by the early sixties, he had to build an entirely new building, which he dedicated to his wife, Josephine, to house the growing collection. Uh, when Mr. Berger um, got to be an older man, his original plan was to give everything that he had collected to his grandson, Billy. But both Mr. Berger's uh, sons and his grandson predeceased him, and he had no heirs. So his attorney uh, helped him set up a trust at first that would then become Bent Haven Museum, Inc. You, all of you who have been around for a long time may remember John Brooking, who was Mr. Berger's attorney uh, for the last 10 years or so of Mr. Berger's life. It was John Brooking that oversaw the transition from a private collection to an early budding 501c3 to a public museum like it is today. When Mr. Berger died in 1972, he had about 500 dummies and puppets, and some of those were still in the house. The model of the museum is that the curator lives here, and that's what Mr. Berger wanted, was for people to come from all over the world and to have a curator here who would give uh, tours and visits of the collection, but stay right here where he started it. And that's what we've done. Uh, the first curator was Susan DeFelice. In order to move into the house, though, they had so much of his, um, his massive collection was still in there that they had to build an entirely separate building. That building was built in 72-73 uh, in and dedicated to uh, W.S. Berger on June 30th of 1973. If you've been to the grounds before and you've parked on the street, you parked right where the flatbed truck parked, where Edgar Bergen performed with Mortimer Snurd and Jimmy Nelson performed with Danny O'Day and Farfel at the public dedication of that building. So today you're going to go through these three buildings and see the collection as it is today for the final tour in this configuration. I hope I don't do this the whole time, you guys. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of you love me, so you'll forgive me. But anyway, pull it together, Lisa. Get <laughs> professional, right? Um, so as we go along, I hope you'll ask questions. But I want you to experience what thousands and thousands of people have experienced, which is that first breathtaking moment when you walk into this building and see it uh, with a tourist eyes. Come on in to Ben Haven. The initial reaction for most people is, oh my gosh, the number of dummies here is not what people typically expect. I know the first time I came through, the lovely and talented Annie Roberts took me through, and she didn't tell me what to expect. And I thought there would be a handful of, uh, of cases or something, dolls, with a dozen dolls each. And I had no clue that it, the collection would be this massive. So one of the first things to do is to just look around and get used to the sheer number of dummies that are in this collection. The collection continues to grow every year and we get about 20 to 25 a year. Uh, this year we went over 1,000. We have 1,020 and a lot of those for the people out there who like trivia, uh, Jeff Dunham donated dummy number 1,000 uh, with an, uh, one of the Ahmed toys that he sells. So thank you, Jeff, for that. Uh, let's go ahead and look at what how, the growth from just this year. The class of 2021 is pretty typical. For a year, we get mass-produced toys. We get retired figures. We get dummies that have been donated by family members of ventriloquists who have passed. We get toys that people find at yard sales or, or at antique shops. This class is very representative of normal growth for us in, uh, in the type of dummies that we've gotten. And as I said, the growth here is just tremendous. Ben Haven doesn't, solicitate, uh, doesn't uh, solicit donations of dummies and they just keep coming. People want to be represented here because it is a unique museum 
and we're so proud of the growth that we've had here. In fact, so when Mr. Berger passed in 1972, there were about 500 dummies and puppets. And today, like I said, we went over a thousand this year. We have doubled since he has passed. I think he would be so thrilled at the growth that has happened here. One thing that people notice is that there's not just dummies here. The collection today consists of dummies, puppets, photographs, playbills, scripts, recordings, costumes, documentation, anything and everything that you can imagine that has to do with ventriloquism is here. Well, one of my favorite questions that tours ask me is, has so-and-so been here? And that could be anybody uh, from the ventriloquial world, from you know, Edgar Bergen up to Darcy Lynn. Any of those ventriloquists, you know, they wanna know has their favorite been here? And the answer is always yes. We are unique in the world, our convention is unique in the world, and we're so proud of that, and we're so in, uh, proud to be inclusive of everyone. Let's go ahead and walk into this room, and I'll show you some more. Lisa, be be before yeah. you do, Lisa, I have yeah. a question from the audience. Uh, Questions are great. Yep, I have Sheila Brady Speth wants to know, how many have been used in movies? Oh, that's a great question. The one that comes to mind immediately is the one that's going to be in this next room, which was used by Adrian Brody in a movie called Dummy. And it's not the typical uh, ventriloquism movie where it's scary or anything like that. Uh, so that one is the one that first comes to mind. I don't want to leave anybody out. But of course, we've got, um, you know, a variety of figures here. So there's I wouldn't say that we, well, we don't have the dummy from Magic. Um, I'm trying to think we don't have anything like from Annabelle or anything like that. But the dummies that we have are the performance pieces. So whatever the venue was for the performer, that's represented here, whether they were a live performer or on television or in film. Uh, so let me show you the one that Adrian Brody used. Okay. And then I'll have Austin ask his question again, since you're going into the bleacher room. So this one, this is, uh, oh, does he have me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This one is Woodrow. And like I said, this one was used by Adrian Brody for this movie. I'm going to go ahead and hold the, hold the movie Thank up. You. It's called Dummy. And a lot of times when a ventriloquist is in a film or ventriloquism is used, there's no real ventriloquism going on. It's done with the voiceover. But in this case, um, Adrian Brody actually did take ventriloquism lessons and is doing ventriloquism in the film. This dummy was made by Alan Seamock, one of the most beloved figure makers in our, in our community. He just passed uh, not too long ago. We all miss him very much, but his work is just exceptional. So we're very fortunate to have a handful of his pieces here in the collection. Do I have another question, Al? Well, let me go ahead and have uh, Austin's questions answered. Okay. Especially maybe as <laughs> Annie gets a shot of the bleachers because I think it's pretty appropriate. So here's Austin's question again. But Lisa, aren't you creeped up by these things? Yes, that question and its derivatives in a no number of forms are asked on nearly every tour because the majority of my tourists are not ventriloquists. So they're not exposed to it to the degree that the ventriloquism community is. And so their first reaction is one of, wow, I feel like I'm being stared at or, or this is creepy or, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And are you sure these don't come alive at night? All of those types of questions. And so I, I, what I do with that question is I just address it as it is. You are supposed to perceive life here. If you don't perceive life in these puppets and dummies, then the figure maker did a terrible job. You should feel that they are getting ready to speak to you, that they're getting ready to move and blink and talk to you because that's what a good figure maker can, can make happen. And that's what an excellent ventriloquist does. The illusion of life is the nature of ventriloquism. So it's actually very complimentary for people to say that about the dummies here at Bent Haven. Do we have another question, Al? It's there on screen, Lisa. It's, do you all have a slappy? So is there a slappy in oh, the museum from Land and Harbor? I get asked that all the time, and we do not have one yet. So I would love, if someone out there has one and they would like to donate it, we'd love to have one for the collection. We are donation-based only, so it's not that we're going to go buy one ourselves. I'm sure one will come to the collection because everything will end up here at some point. But yeah, the Slappies were the most recognized um, characters now, especially for the younger audiences. So if you have an extra Slappy, you can always send it to Venhaven and he could join the family here. Good deal. And here's an interesting question too. Oops, I'm sorry. Jumped ahead of me there. Jim Ott asked, does Venhaven have to decline some offers of Vent figures? I've never heard that oh, question before. That's a good one. 
That's a great question. In general, we would not decline because if it's a ventriloquism, if it was used in a ventriloquism act, even by a hobbyist or an amateur, we want that here. And I actually talk about that on regular tours as well. Mr. Berger was very inclusive. He cast a worldwide net. He wanted the, the entire collection to be international. So he did not restrict what was allowed in. Let me show you some examples. Right where you've got these great professional dummies like this one by Ken Spencer or this one by J.C. Turner, where you've got these, these dummies that are clearly made by professionals. You've also got some pieces where the person is just beginning to learn how to work with materials. So this uh, balsa wood carving, it's not a high-end professional dummy. That We still want it here. It still represents the ventriloquism community and the process, the learning process that takes place when you're a figure maker. So just as our convention wants ventriloquists who just took it up yesterday and haven't learned how to do their labials yet, we want dummies here of the entire spectrum of figure making. So no, we have not turned down a piece. If it has a moving mouth, we want it here at Vent Haven. All right, good deal. We're gonna take a break for the questions right now. I'll let you keep on going, Lisa. All right, so at this point in the tour, when people are in here, what typically happens is they find a favorite on the bleachers. And this is where I get all the people doing their selfies, you know, and wanting to get the picture and capture this, the people that are doing panoramic shots. So in the new building, we will have uh, another bleacher type experience, but I will really miss that, that there's a hundred dummies here that are all sitting together and this great snapshot of the entire collection. On the opposite wall, are the photos of our annual convention. Ben Haven has had a convention since 1975. Uh, the, uh, so we put all the convention photos up here. The 1975 photo, or actually it was not a, photo, a, a picture taken until the next year in 1976. But people love the convention photos. They love to see the growth. And of course, the conventioneers, when they're here, they spend a lot of time like zooming in and saying, well, there I am. Oh, I would, there I am. So that's a lot of fun for them, too. Uh, my favorite convention photo would be our 2020 convention. And people, I think this is very funny that in spite of not having a convention, uh, Annie and Danny Baker and myself here and Barbara Baxter, we went out anyway and we took our picture by the fountain to mark time. Uh, the 2021 convention photo will be up next year. And so uh, we, we're going to celebrate them all no matter what. Now, now I right. do have a bone to pick, Lisa. We did do yeah. a virtual convention in 2020. That's so right. That's that. exactly right. We did. We sell, and we, yeah. yeah, we did a ton of stuff, uh, yep. but we did have to, we wanted to have a place marker here out. Exactly. For, and I can have Brian Photoshop you in. Would you like that? <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, I've got a great screenshot <laughs> at one point, but yeah. Yeah, we have that uh, video certainly in per perpetuity. So, well, I got there you a couple go. of questions. This is a great question from Pete Michaels Jr. Since we we're talking about Slappy, will there be a horror dummy exhibit? Example, magic, goosebumps, si dead, uh, dead silence, dead of the night, um, that kind of a thing in the future. So it's a good question. Oh. I'll refer to those. That's a great question because we have to deal with the fact that we are a family friendly museum. We don't want someone to bring their children here and have them be scared. OK, the dummies themselves, um, you know, that's, they've got characteristics that are off putting for some people. What we wouldn't want to do is deliberately uh, make a negative image about ventriloquism. And the other side of that is that we can't display what we don't have. We don't have those dummies. So there's nothing really there to work with to make a nice exhibit. If we were to do something about maybe the, you know, the Twilight Zone episodes, magic and all of that, we would probably create that as a private exhibit, perhaps in the Jimmy Nelson building, where it wouldn't be part of the general tour, but people could come and see those things if they, if they want. Because Peter, you're right, people are very attached to that, that route of that use of ventriloquism. And sometimes they're disappointed that the museum isn't scary, you know, that they want it to be scary and it's just not. So at this point, we don't have the materials to create that exhibit. And in addition to that, we want to always make everyone feel welcome and comfortable here and be able to bring their children and not worry that there would be something frightening for them. All right. And, you know, we have a question that will be, will be asked a lot. I think you'll address it again later on, but sure. how will they be stored during the renovation? I don't know if you want to address that now or come back to that later on. Sure, I can. Uh, because on a typical tour this whole year, I've been talking about the renovation. We're so grateful that the funding is essentially complete. There's a little, we've got a little bit to go. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not throwing, <laughs> I'm not putting fireworks out. I'm still out here fundraising, but 
but we are proceeding with with building. And so the, the everything in this building and in the one that we're going to go into next does have to be moved. The majority of it is going to go into the Josephine Berger Memorial Building, uh, yeah, Memorial Building, and into the Jimmy Nelson Building, and then other pieces are going to go into. Um, into the house. I've emptied one of the bedrooms there for storage. And so it'll, it's going to be some creativity to get it done. But for those of you who have been around long enough, you know that we've done this before. This building that we're in has been renovated actually a number of times, but a major renovation in 2009. And so we know that this all, this, everything in here can fit into the other building. So it's going to be quite a task. But when, when tourists ask me, where are you going to put all this stuff? Of course, I go for the quick answer and say, why at your house, of course, <laughs> and get the quick laugh that way. Oh, so, you're a card. You are oh, a card. I'm a card, okay. Al. So here's a great um, question from Tom. Um, Tom Frew wants to know, what measures that do you have to take to prevent moth damage, et cetera, or other harmful insects, termites, or hazards, that type of thing? Great question. That's also asked by a lot of tourists. And so what the, the answer to that is that our second largest bill here is Orkin. Uh, after the electricity, we have the best pest control contract you can imagine. And they are here all the time uh, looking for that kind of thing. I have two feral cats that keep us rodent free on the outside and then Orkin with pests on the inside. Now, we've had a problem in the past. And imagine this with Mr. Berger before air conditioning where the little silverfish, they wanna come inside and they'll come in around the windows sometimes and try to set up camp in one of the photographs. So part of, the, part of keeping all that at bay is inspection and cleaning. So twice a year, every year, everything gets inspected and cleaned. And that also prevents anything from getting out of hand. I usually will find was one or two, three silverfish in the photos, but as far as interior pests, we don't have a problem with that. But thank you for that. It's a great question because you're right. A mouse getting in here could do a ton of damage prior to us even finding it. If it wasn't that, if it wasn't for the vigilance of inspection. Well, I got to tell you, Lisa, we have a ton of questions, so I don't know how okay. you want to go about well, answering those. Well, to be honest, that is how I manage most tours because people okay. come in, they don't typically have a lot of questions on the driveway, but when they come in and they see everything, then the questions just start flowing. So it's fine with me. We can go okay. ahead and move to the next building if you like, so that sure. people can see the other items. Well, while you're doing that, uh, you know, there is a question about multiple figures. Uh, are there, are there uh, displayed at the same time if you have a multiple of the same figure? Um, so we can address that when you come back and a few others. So, why don't you go ahead uh, and, and go make your move and I'm going to take over the feed here. And when you're ready, just uh, shoot me a wave and I'll put you back on the screen. Sound good. All right. I'll see you in building one. All right. Sounds good. All right. So fa folks, fantastic question so far. Vent Haven is just a uh, fabulous, fabulous resource for those uh, who, who, um, who certainly have been here. And if you have not been there, I got to tell you, it's exciting what's happening. These old buildings are going down. Uh, but the new one, uh, What's incredible about it is the support that Vent Haven has, not only from the Vent community, which we call ventriloquist, the Vent community, but also the fact that there are so many people in the Fort Mitchell area now that are calling Vent Haven theirs. Lisa was telling us recently the bank right up the corner from um, uh, from the, the building. Um, you know, they they were going to give a donation. I'll let Lisa tell more about this when she comes back. But um, a sizable donation came from the local bank, some sizable donations from local businesses, some grants, lots of things that, that Lisa and, and Annie Roberts and Tom Ladshaw uh, and the board of directors have done to bring revenues in to allow this renovation to happen. And also some major donors. Now, we're not here to talk about the new building tonight. We'll do another show about that. But we are here to take one last look at these buildings. So now Lisa is at the front door of building one. And she's going to take you inside and show you what's in that very special building. All right, Lisa, you're back. Hi, Al. Thank you. I thank you for walking me across the yard. That's, uh, you know, usually when I'm just talking to people about what they do with their lives and when they're asking me, how do you get this job? Uh, this is the W.S. Berger uh, Memorial Building. This was the one that was built in 1973. And it's also coming down with construction. So we're going to walk through this. Uh, when I talk to my general tourist, the the gist of this building is the chronology of ventriloquism so people can see the art form over time. Uh, the first building, the garage building, is more about Mr. Berger. I talked a lot about him and his commitment to ventriloquism. So let's go in here and uh, finish up with Mr. Berger and then do a timeline. Come on in.
This corner is dedicated to Mr. Berger, our founder. And this dummy here is seated is Tommy Baloney. This was the first dummy that Mr. Berger got. He got him in 1910. Thanks to Marianne and Glenn Taylor for adopting him, by the way. I love him and his little hound's tooth cap and his little shoes, little button up shoes. Aren't they adorable? Mr. Berger's favorite dummy was this little guy, Skinny Hamilton, who's sitting here in a tuxedo. Now, Mr. Berger didn't get him in a tuxedo. There's a, a picture right here hanging on the wall of Skinny. Totally different body there. But of course, you know, once Edgar Bergen puts Charlie McCarthy in a tuxedo, everybody and their brother puts their dummies in a tux. It's interesting that people come here and think that that's Charlie uh, when they first walk in because it's a dummy in a tuxedo. And of course, it's Frank Marshall, which is so much like the Max style that um, I, I almost hesitate to correct them. But, you know, I got to do my job. So uh, Mr. Berger's favorite uh, custom piece here is Jocko the monkey. And we have, uh, he's probably the favorite in the vent community as far as I think if I said, hey, you can take any dummy you want home with you. I think a lot of ventriloquists would pick to take home Jocko. And then of course, Mr. Berger's favorite uh, walking dummy was Champagne Charlie. I say it's his favorite walking dummy because we have some great photos of him being very, very proud when he got uh, Champagne Charlie. So then the rest of the building is, Oh, we're going to look at that. Oh, we're going to look at the picture. There we go. Hold there on. he is with Champagne Charlie at the top of the stairs in the house. Can't see it. Terrible reflection. That's okay. Got a reflection on that one. So the remainder of the building are um, professional ventriloquists and people that are going to have uh, a broader audience than, uh, than what we've seen in the other building. Now, all of these people uh, represent some very, very big names in ventriloquial history. But what I tell everybody, and the, the, the octogenarians love it, is that we're all too young to know these people. But if we were 100 years older, if we were just 100 years older, we'd be standing here ooing and aahing and, oh, my gosh, about Frank Byron Jr. Uh, this dummy was used by the great Lester, who was this amazing uh, vaudevillian ventriloquist. He was born in 1878, the same year as Mr. Berger. And one record has that he was making $1,500 a week. What? In 1903. Uh, after his uh, stage career was completed, he uh, ha had a series of lessons that you could get and learn ventriloquism. And that's what this board is back here. Uh, this is his, his lessons board. Couple of connections for those of you who are watching. Um, Frank Byron Jr. was the dummy that Al Gettler chose. Thank you, Al, when we did our favorite figure videos a few years ago. And then also Jay Johnson, one of our beloved advisors and good friends, uh, used this teaching board in a lecture that he gave at our convention. So thank you to you guys for that. Then as we move forward, depending on the demographic of my tourists, I ask them if they're a fan of spaghetti westerns, and I talk about Elmer being used by Max Terhune. Sometimes I get a hit on that, and sometimes I get a miss. But if you're a, a western fan, you might know Elmer. The oohs and ahs start next. I think I should turn the air off while we're in here. Does that sound bothering you? Al, is that sound of the air conditioner problematic? No, I don't hear it at all. Um, okay. I have a worse sound there with a fan of my laptop. Sometimes it messes with the audio. Yeah. But by the time I turn the corner with most of my tour groups, they go, oh, yeah. And they remember Senior Wences using his hand as Johnny on the Ed Sullivan show. It's, uh, my, my understanding is that uh, Senior Wences was on the Ed Sullivan show, I believe, 47 times. And a lot of people want to talk about him because they remember those, the, the, either Pedro or Johnny growing up or watching the Ed Sullivan show with their family. I'll throw a little bit of trivia in there too, Lisa. Um, the reason he was on the show so many times is he and his wife, Tally, lived around the corner from the theater. So if an act had to bail out the last second, Senior Wences, there you go. Yes, yes, yes. Senior Wences Way is right up there next to the Ed Sullivan right. Theater. Exactly yes. right. So now we're over here to Edgar Bergen. Uh, depending on my demographic, I sometimes spend as much as 30 minutes standing here talking about Edgar Bergen. Uh, for the 20th century ventriloquist, there is no one even comes close to this level of fame that was achieved and this level of public recognition. Of course, Edgar Bergen lived from 1903 to 1978. And he was so popular after doing vaudeville and Chautauqua, 
that he ended up with his own radio show from 1937 to 1956. People often ask, has Candace Bergen ever been here? And the answer is yes. When we were on a, CB, uh, on a 60 Minutes 2 segment in 2004, Candace Bergen came here as the correspondent for that piece. I think that piece is still up on our website where you can go and watch that if you like. This is the part of the tour where people start to get connected and they start to have memories. One of my favorite things that happens here is the response of octogenarians. They come maybe on a bus and they get off the, the, the little bus and they come in, start taking the tour and they're using walkers and they're using canes. And some of them are complaining about the lack of seats. They, they have tired feet and they will turn this corner and see Charlie and they stand straighter and they start laughing and they tell stories and they remember episodes of the radio show or they remember seeing one of the movies that Bergen did and it, it takes them back in time. So they might get off that bus 95 years old, but when they get back on that bus, they are a whole, whole lot younger. It's one of my very favorite things that happens on tours with the senior citizens who come through here. So I'm excited about that. I'd love to share all of this memorabilia. Uh, the cabinet, a lot of the memorabilia in the cabinet uh, has come from different sources. Tom Latshaw has given the museum uh, some a lot of Bergen merchandise. Uh, I know we've got, there was a big, big collection of it before I got here. And then we've also had several donations of it uh, since, I've, since I've been curator. In fact, I have a, a big donation of Bergen memorabilia that's coming in tomorrow. The next ventriloquist to talk about is usually Paul Winchell. Uh, Paul Winchell was born in 1922, and I start helping people get their perspective on where we are in time. Uh, Lucille Ball was born in 1911, Carol Burnett's born in 1933, and Paul is right in between there. Uh, Paul Winchell, of course, was the first ventriloquist to have his own television show. And many people remember him, but because the show wasn't syndi is syndicated and isn't, doesn't even exist anymore, it's a little bit more of a struggle for people unless they were fans to start with. So I have to spend some time talking about Paul and the different things that he did, like using green screen technology when that became available, his creativity in having Jerry and Knucklehead in unique situations. There's a big artistic difference, in my opinion, between Edgar Bergen and Paul Winchell. Paul was really the first ventriloquist that I'm aware of who was very, very interested in children learning the art. And so where Bergen had all of these wonderful collectibles and a lot of merchandise available, I feel like Paul spent more time wanting kids to do it and that a lot of his merchandise was educational. He had the games and he had the novelties and all of that, but the Jerry Mahoney dummies and, the, and those are so popular and people remember getting those. So that's kind of neat for those. A lot of people, of course, uh, know Paul as a ventriloquist, but they're surprised to learn that he invented the artificial heart, that he developed plasma bags, that he had the, the, the patent for the disposable razor, the patent for the retractable fountain pen, which was the prototype for the ballpoint pen and many, many others. When I first started learning about Paul, I felt like I was being, um, I said I was being uh, teased because it was um, Tom that was telling me all this about Paul. And I thought, this isn't true. This man couldn't have done all that. But um, in fact, it is true. And I love that the internet anyway, gives Paul credit for inventing the artificial heart. Uh, the other thing about Paul Winchell that I talk about is um, the fact that he was a, um, a voice actor and people will connect if they don't know him as a ventriloquist when I say he was the voice of Tigger. He was the voice of Tigger for, in the Winnie the Pooh. That also is like, oh, oh yeah. And then when I start listing those voices, he was the Scrubbing Bubbles character. And he was the Owl in the Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop commercial. He was Gargamel from the Smurfs. He was Dick Dastardly. That connection for them ties so many more people to the community that they leave knowing quite a bit about Paul Winchell the man and not just Paul Winchell the uh, ventriloquist. Hey Lisa, about hey Lisa yeah. follow my yeah. lead here for one second. Um, could you turn the corner and go to the back corner, uh, front corner, really quickly for me, and talk back about where we were um, at Lester? No, the other side. The other side. We're gonna we're gonna go contemporary for a second. 
uh, where Jeff's shop way. is. Yeah, yeah, that area right there. Go, yeah. Could you go over yeah. there real quick for me? Yeah. Yeah. Just go over there. No, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Turn to the right, Annie. Turn to the right. Turn to the right, Annie. What I want to ask you is, while you're giving the tour, does anybody ever show up there that was actually in the museum? Um, you know, while you're giving the tour, just wondering. Uh, no, that has never happened. That would be really? trouble. It never, it's never happened oh. before. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> He's at home. Hi, Lisa. I He's in his office. Here. I thought you were here, Jeff. I went outside looking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. I'm sorry to in interrupt, but I just wanted to say you're doing a fine job. And my favorite part about the tour right now is there's no one yes. there asking annoying questions. <laughs> well, Al is doing that for me, so that's really good. I know. It's, it's just him, and it's limited to a few. But this is really... Uh, honestly, Lisa, this is really, really fun seeing it this way and seeing the whole thing without interruption, and it's great. And uh, I, I'm just so sad that this is the last time we're going to see this show because you've done such a, an amazing job. You and, and when Annie was curator, and this is just yeah. really, really, really great. And it's I just I can't believe it's going to be torn down to nothing here soon. I know September 20th, right? I know I'm I'm trying. I choked up there at the beginning, but I've been holding it together because you know somebody maybe 100 years from now will watch this video and go, "What was wrong with her?" Uh, but the, <laughs> just the idea that yeah, there's so much history here, and and uh, you know obviously Jeff, your influence has been gargantuan. I was going to say that when when I was when I was first at the beginning of this building, you know, so many people who come here are fans of yours. And they won't listen at first, the little ones, especially the teenagers, 20 somethings, they don't care about the great Lester. I mean, come on, let's be real. And they race over around here and I have to like peaky pie and make sure they don't try to lift some piece of your memorabilia out of the collection. So you're, you're saying so the I, kids today love dead terrorists. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, they do. They do. Well, I, I, I didn't, I don't know if this was, I've been watching on and off because my kids were getting ready to go. I, I to, We're taking them to, kindergarten for the first time to meet their teachers tonight that's why i had to jump in here real quick but I, I i missed it did did so did you wear black on purpose today oh i just wear <laughs> black so i guess for the reflection or whatever but i i mean it is such a mixed feeling don't you think when you were here it's just it's like yay because you know ws burger would be like yeah gross, well, I know, but it's like it's like the death of the old museum so it's just so oh, sad no. so you wore black it's just so very sad <laughs> on which is oh, the color okay. of you know royalty and rebirth too so a kind of a, a, a combo message here i guess i guess i guess it is but you know <laughs> for those who've never been to the museum it's just this charming charming place because the grounds it's a house uh it was ws's house and uh, a home it was a home and and very rarely do you get to go to a museum that was someone's home for so many years and so there's all that warmth there and you know, all the families that have taken care of the place and have been there for, you know, throughout the decades. And uh, uh, so now, uh, but those buildings, the house is going to stay, but now the buildings are going and that's still part of the home. But it is really exciting to see what's coming around the corner and uh, to what the place is going to be uh, after after this. It's, it's great. But I and and the other thing that cracks me up is that I, I, have you answered this? Where are the dummies all going to go when that building gets torn down? Are they all going to the house? Uh, that was going to just ship them to you. Is that okay? <laughs> well, I, uh, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, fine. <laughs> they are going to go. Yeah, I'll, yeah everybody uh, asks because it's such a Herculean task, but everything's going to go into the Josephine Berger building, into the Jimmy Nelson building. I emptied one of the bedrooms upstairs in the house. Uh, so that should be enough space. But yeah, it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. I start tomorrow and wow. I've got until I got until September 20th to get it done. And then bulldozers are in the yard September 20th. We're going to have a live feed of demolition. So that's very exciting. That's great. Now, is it, so are you going to take the dummies in any organized fashion? Or are you just going to pick them on up and take them over there two at a time? Hold them like this. How, how are you going to do it? Really? Well, I was just going to grab them by the neck, you know what I mean? And just drag them across the yard. Well, that's normally what your tours are like. You just. Take yeah. them I was thinking more of a, or maybe a bucket brigade where you just throw them into the arms of the next person. How about yeah. that? But seriously, no, it's it's highly crazy. organized. Yeah. I'm yeah. an army brat. I've moved 25 times. This is going to be a high, high quality, precise mission. Um, I've got a whole plan. 
Hopefully, I mean, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but yes, I have a plan. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're going to grab two at a time and shove them each in the corner until they all fit in the room, right? I'll show Can I just demonstrate with peanut? I'll just grab them by the foot. <laughs> and I got, yeah, I mean, I could use them as a cat toy, right? <laughs> a cat toy. That's perfect. Peanut as a cat toy. That's brilliant. All right. Well, I don't want to, and again, I don't want to interrupt anymore. You guys are doing such a fine job. What a beautiful place. And it's a shame you've kept it so clean for so long because now it's all going to be dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you were here. I wish you were here, Jeff, because, uh, you know, we'd be thrilled to have you throw the first sledgehammer through the wall. <laughs> oh, well, I, I wish I was there too. But uh, yeah, but again, you guys are doing great. And I, I can't, uh, and what's the completion date? But you know what the as contractors go, what are they saying? Right, they're saying six months. So I think a year and a half, three years max. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Convention twenty twenty five, the grand opening, perfect. <laughs> yeah, really. So we, right. they're saying six months. I'm hoping we don't know. We honestly, we don't know if we'll be open in May, June, or July. I'm. I'm rooting for the convention. I'd like the the conventioners, the ventriloquists to see it first. I don't I just honestly don't know. So we'll know more as we go along. That's great. All right. And and you have to keep a log of all the great frustrations. <laughs> the what? <laughs> Of all the great, well, the great frustration started today when oh. the electric guy came out and they were talking about power sources during construction. And it turns out that all four buildings are running off power from building one. And so when they demolish this building, I can't turn the lights on in three or four. <laughs> That's great. All right. So the next fundraiser is for generators. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Al, thank you for letting me interrupt. And I, I again, I, I can't wait to see what happens. And I'll be watching the live feed on the demolition for sure. That's great. Yes. So thank good you, of you Jeff. to be here, Jeff. We, uh, we appreciate that. And good luck with the boys tonight. But, and Al, I love the fact that this is the first time I've ever seen you do it in a T-shirt. rather than. A I know. And, you know, here's the deal. I wore my, my Vent Life T-shirt, right? So, oh, very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right. A little informal tonight, Jeff. Thanks yeah, for you're kind, of, you're kind of hot, Al. <laughs> <laughs> you wow. too. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See you, Thank Jeff. You, Jeff. Bye. 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 Well, Lisa, just a little surprise for you. Well, thank you. I didn't know. It. I thought he was going to maybe do a recorded question. So it's always well, great we have to have that you too, But you know what? Um, we have uh, We have almost 200 folks that have hung in here so far. Uh, you know, we have people who have never been here before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jay Johnson just said, did I miss anything? I just went to the John. I hope to, uh, to visit someday. Jim is a figure maker. He, he does some great stuff. You know, there's just so many, there's so many great comments um, oh. about this. And I just think it's fantastic. So sorry to interrupt. Go on back over no, where you okay. were. I'm going to get off the screen. We got a bunch of questions to ask. Let you finish okay. up on building one. Okay. All right. So here we are in time uh, to our wonderful Dean of American Ventriloquists, uh, Jimmy Nelson. And this is the exhibit that most of you have seen for the last, I don't know, maybe five or 10 years of Jimmy's Danny and Farfel. These are, of course, the um, the backups that he had. And um, we the family this year donated the the other Danny and Farfel, Fatata Tita and Humphrey Higsby. So those will be on exhibit in the new building. And uh, for the ventriloquists right now and not just but the regular tourists, I just want you to know that um, in our board of advisors meeting a few years ago, it was Jimmy that said, you guys, we have got to get this building done. And he was the cheerleader. He was the unifier who basically started us off in this um, determination to get to this point. And I so wish that he were here for this. I know he's looking down and so proud of uh, all we've accomplished. And I'm sure he's also thinking now, make sure that you get Jimmy and or Danny in a good light. So uh, the Nelson family can be very, very assured that Jimmy Nelson will always, always have a seat of honor and a magnificent uh, exhibit here at Vent Haven. So I'm very much looking forward to, um, to setting that up. When we did the renovation of this building uh, a few years ago, when we got rid of the library and made this a circuit instead of a horseshoe, um, 
Farfel was the last out of the building before renovation, and he was the first in after it was completed. And that's my plan again, uh, kind of giving a call back to one of Jeff's questions. Uh, Farfel will be the last to sit in this building, and he'll go up first when we get the new building built. Pull it together. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, then we're up here to some more contemporary ventriloquists, of course, Sherry Lewis and Willie Tyler and Lester. Uh, Willie Tyler is on our board of advisors, and he was the closing act this year at our uh, convention. So wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, my tourists typically know him from his uh, being on Laugh-In as, as that first time that they were familiar with him. And of course, his career is absolutely iconic, phenomenal person, and just has done so much A uh, Hillary coming called Hello Dummy that we got to see part of at our convention this year. Most people, when they get here, if they don't, if they say they can't think of a single ventriloquist, when I when they see a photograph of Sherry Lewis, it just oh they say oh yeah Sherry Lewis Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. Of course, Sherry was uh, one of the most significant ventriloquists in history, particularly because as a woman, uh, it was difficult for her in show business. One of my favorite things about her, of course, is the fact that she held lamb chop just right up next to her face. Uh, she, her skill was so tremendous that she didn't need any distance between her face and lamb chops to talk. They had a very intimate connection. Uh, today, Mallory Lewis has lamb chop, and I believe it was the um, New York City uh, Puppetry Fringe Festival that Mallory had lamb chop at just last week, I believe, is when that happened. I could be misnaming that festival. But Lamb Chop is out and about in the world, still uh, being voiced by Mallory. Next up is Madam. And it's just a very rare ventriloquist, or very rare tourist who knows that Waylon Flowers was not a ventriloquist. Uh, this puppet, of course, is so significant in entertainment history. And many people remember, um, remember Madam and Waylon Flowers uh, from Hollywood Squares when they replaced um, Paul Lind as the center square in Hollywood Squares. And of course, then there were the subsequent shows. I loved Hollywood Squares. It was one of my favorite shows. That's probably because of Peter Marshall as the host. A lot of people here uh, think that Peter Marshall was a ventriloquist. Isn't that odd? And I'm just like, that must be an urban legend or something, because I've never heard that Peter Marshall did any ventriloquism. So maybe somebody out there can uh, confirm or deny that Peter ever did that. So Lisa, we have one, one comment from the audience. Sure. This is Dale. Why isn't Lisa talking about my chip? He's right in front of her. I'm not there yet, Dale, but I was planning on getting him out <laughs> and using his wig to kind of sweep up some dust that had gathered here. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not there yet. Could you wait a second? Uh, Jim Barber Strum, this dummy gets so much attention that I don't want to leave it out. Person after person after person will stand here and ask me about Jim. And so I love talking about Jim Barber's creativity and his use of this great uh, guitar. It's unique and it's a novelty. Jim donated that when we went out to a, a fundraiser show that he had back for Event Haven back in um, 2013. So that dummy gets, I mean, it just gets so much attention, I guess, you know, because of its novelty. Then of course we moved to Jay Johnson. One of the nicest people I've ever met in real life. I love you, Jay. I hope you're watching. Although maybe you went to the restroom again and didn't want me to talk about you. Uh, the, Jay, of course, is on every single tour. Uh, Jay is primarily known in the general public for his uh, time on soap. So I talk quite a bit about soap. And again, when we were talking earlier about things being scary, there's that the stereotype of ventriloquism that Jay really explores on soap. Uh, with the other cast characters reacting to Bob uh, in various ways. And I love that show. It's such a great show. And then, of course, Jay, Jay won a Tony Award in 2007 for Best Theatrical Event, and we're so proud of him for that. Uh, Jay's also on our board of advisors and does, I don't know, somersaults for Bent Haven. He just does anything that we need, and I'm so grateful, Jay, for your support over the years. My favorite thing in the Jay Johnson exhibit, though, and this is, again, not something I talk about necessarily in every tour, but because most of you guys might be ventriloquists, is this note back here on the wall. When Jay made his uh, donation of a lot of his pieces to Vent Haven, that note was in the suitcase uh, that Squeaky came in. And that note is from his mom. 
And I just think it is the sweetest thing. And I felt almost like it was an invasion of his privacy to read that note from his mother. And I remember uh, asking Jay if he wanted it back because it was a personal note from his mom to him. So thank you, Jay, for letting us have all of those things. Okay, so then down here, we've got Chip Martin. And I'm going to talk about Chip Martin. Uh, not that tourists do, Dale, because they're too busy talking about Strum and Jim. But this is Chip, a Greg Lovick figure that, that, um, that Dale donated. Dale knows that I love him. He's a very, very good friend of the museum. He and his wife, Leslie, have just done so much for us over the years. I do enjoy the outfit here. I must say that. But, uh, Dale, I would like to know where his shoes went. Don't have any shoes, Dale. No shoes. All right. By this time in the tour, uh, hey, we Lisa, are up um, to, what, yeah. Real quick, somebody wanted to know, Benita Joy Yoder, wanted to know if you could read the note out loud from Jay's mom. Sure. Here okay. I go. Here you go, Benita. Uh, whoa. All right. Now, Benita, is it Benita that was asking? That is correct, yes. Benita, I don't have my glasses on, so you're going to have to forgive me for the squinting. Oh, here's Annie. See, tech support. Does this work? Jay, what do I say about Squeaky? There are so many memories wrapped in that little figure, so many costumes attempted, so many props attempted, and I wanted a professional figure for you all that time, and yet we learned so much on Squeaky. I have not opened the case in a very long time, so I don't know the condition of the figure, but whatever it is, you cannot take the memories from the years you got so much out of that little figure. You taught me so much. I love you greatly, Mom. Isn't that precious? The support. Um, I just think that just that's just so personal. So Jay, thank you for letting that, us have that. That is amazing, Benita. Thank you for asking us to read that read that out loud. That was really special. Yes. And you know, again, back to the Tony Award. I mean. I tell people that constantly that <clears throat> most folks don't realize just how our art was part of the Broadway scene. And I remind them of Jay's show uh, and what he did for ventriloquism. So uh, just fantastic stuff. Thanks, Lisa. There was kind of a lull in, um, in ventriloquism as far as the public consciousness was concerned after the Ed Sullivan show went off the air in the early seventies uh, there was just there was there was Jay on soap and there was Willie Tyler and there was Sherry, but there wasn't a program that was featuring variety acts. It wasn't there wasn't anything comparable to Ed Sullivan really on the air. There was sitcoms and and there were sketch comedies. So there's kind of this lull where many many people went without seeing a ventriloquist on television, and so that was a difficult time uh, for people that were trying to learn from one another and get into the art. It was much more isolation at that point, and the ventriloquists were on cruise ships and in comedy clubs and doing those things, but in the public consciousness, it really wasn't represented. So a couple of things are happening in the background during that time. For one is Jeff Dunham. Um, I hope he's not online anymore because I, I have to sing his praises because, of course, I do because of all he's contributed, but, ew, if you're listening, Jeff, I'm not meaning any of this. Ew. Okay, just kidding. Uh, Jeff started doing ventriloquism as a very small boy, and he didn't really do anything else that I know of. He was so committed to this, and he entertained people at school. We have um, uh, strips that he made when he did birthday parties for $5. He was just very committed, and his career is amazing. What I always tell people, though, is a couple of things. First of all, he works so hard at this. People sometimes assume that he's always been Jeff Dunham, but in fact, he at one point was Jeff Dunham. <laughs> now, I don't blame him for the hairdo. You know what I mean? I don't blame him for the hairdo. It's the style of the time, right? I don't blame him for getting braces because who didn't get braces, right? But Jeff, on a, on a deliberate day, on school picture day, Jeff got up and said, hey, that tie goes with that jacket. I'm set. This is Jeff Dunham. And, I, you know, I, I use it as a joke, but I also talk to kids and I tell them, you have got to put in the work. 
You have got to put in the creativity. You've got to risk failure. You have got to perform for audiences of all sizes. You have got to build up what you're doing. And the same reference to those dummies that were seated on the bleachers that are not highly professional quality dummies, you have to start somewhere. So the kids that come or the young people who come who idolize Jeff, that's great. But don't think that he got there because he was somebody when he started. He had to do the work. And that's what I use Jeff's exhibit for mostly. The big deal that happened in Jeff's life after his 10,000 hours of touring and, and doing comedy clubs and doing all of the shows and building a fan base was arguing with myself. And he funded that himself. And it was the, the most watched Comedy Central special. I don't know if the record stands today. Jeff would probably know. But at the time, it was the most watched Comedy Central special. He, he took a chance, too, by funding that himself. He didn't know. Had he done enough work? He didn't know. But it turns out he had done more than enough. His fan base was huge and loyal. And Comedy Central was more than happy to, to cover the next handful of specials. Uh, another thing about Jeff is that he, he supports Vet Haven. He will help me do anything I need to do. He's been in lectures with Annie and me. He has lent us dummies. He has repaired dummies. And so I just want to give Jeff his due, not just as superstar Jeff Dunham, yeah, but as just Ben Haven supporter Jeff Dunham. He is a good friend, and I'm very, very grateful for all that he has done and continues to do for the health of this museum. So thank you, Jeff, sincerely. Thank you so much for all that you do for Ben Haven as well. You know, Lisa, it's interesting. Uh, David Pitt says he's rereading Jeff's autobiography, which I've told Jeff, um, Jeff on many occasions. It, it's almost a, um, uh, a motivational book on sticking to it. But what's kind of incredible about some of the folks that you've mentioned, a lot of the folks that you've mentioned so far, Willie Tyler, Jay Johnson, um, um, Winchell to an extent in his career, certainly Jimmy Nelson, <clears throat> one and Sherry Lewis. One thing they all have in common is they did have that stick to itiveness. They did decide to do this and dedicated themselves to it. And it's kind of an amazing thing about ventriloquism that way, with so many of us doing it for so long. But <clears throat> but it is uh, really comes out special in Jeff's book, just that dedication, especially his hard fight, you know, to get to the top. But uh, so I just want to mention that someone happened to mention they're reading the autobiography. If you haven't read it yet, it's really a good read. Yes. Yeah. All right. So that was in 2006 that the arguing with myself special happened and it blew up and it was great. And then the following year, Terry Fader won America's Got Talent. So we have Jeff on cable on Comedy Central and his audience base watching that and growing and uh, the growing awareness of ventriloquism. And then uh, Terry won uh, America's Got Talent the second year that show was on. America's Got Talent has done so much for variety acts of all types, but three times now a ventriloquist has won the show. And that has done a lot for our tourism as well. The last thing in this building is a sample of our library. Uh, the museum has over a thousand books on ventriloquism plus a whole lot of other paper that is just not available to be seen. And this is a sample of that library. Uh, in the new building, we hope to be able to share more of that with people. I love when somebody call, would like email me and they'll say, hey, can I have blah, 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 copy of this, that, or the other? And I think, well, there's so much here. So if you ask me about like Paul Winchell, what do you have on Paul Winchell? And I say, well, books, posters, recordings, Playbills. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, plus correspondence. So it's, uh, you know, when people, I think, think of things that are much smaller than they are actually are here at Ben Haven, the archives are massive. So we hope to share more of those as time goes on. All right. So I people ask, Sorry, Lisa. We've had a couple of people, uh, Peter Valentin's comments up here, but a few people have asked about Cecil Wigglenose, that you did not uh, give us a look at Cecil as you were going by. But he lives well, in that building. on a regular tour, that question would not be asked because Cecil hasn't been in this building for two years. Uh -huh. I knew Cecil and I put him with the McElroy exhibit right. uh, two years ago. So he, yeah, I'll go. show him if you want me to, which is part of a normal tour. So I will yep. do that. But he's no, not, that's, he's not that's great. So, Lisa, I am going to share a question 
uh, okay. because we had one of our uh, one of our board of advisor members ask a question. So I need okay. to hop on over there, switch it on. It takes one second to do it, and we'll have okay. a question from Steve Axtell. <gasps> I don't get it, Lisa. Lisa, how how do you clean those puppets? That's the question. How how do you clean the puppets? Yeah. So Steve's question was, how do you clean those puppets? Very good. Well, uh, we did post a cleaning video of how the collection is clean. So that's on our YouTube page. But in general, it's a mindset. You have to get ready. Every spring, I have a variety of tools that I use, of course, uh, to clean them all. I come out and in my mind's eye, the museum is divided into regions and I clean them one region at a time. I clean every photograph, I'm looking for bugs that like we talked about before, and I pull everything out and then clean the floor, and then I start putting things back. Uh, we want them all handled once or twice a year, like we said, to look for any kind of problem. So it's just breaking it down one chunk at a time. So Jeff Dunham's exhibit, since we're standing right here, uh, these railings come out here in this building. So I lift up the railings and I just take everything out and I move it to the side. And I start in the upper corner here and I dust and I Windex and then I put the trunks back. I wipe them all down. I handle each dummy. I check inside the back to see if there's anything in there. I can clean eyeballs. I can dust their laps and shoulders. And then I start placing them back. Uh, this building, the WS Burger building, takes about eight hours to do. The garage building is almost two full days. And the building we're going to go into last is about a day, day and a half, depending on if I'm putting out new stuff or not. So it's a fun time. I sing a lot of Broadway show tunes to the dummies. And in this building in particular, I sing Ragmop, uh, Jimmy Nelson and Danny's Ragmop. I sing that nearly probably, I guess, 100, 150 times, uh, particularly while I'm cleaning the Jimmy Nelson exhibit. So there you go. So, Lisa, um, I, I, you know, I, we have these celebrity guests coming on asking questions. This celebrity guest, uh, his question was already asked. Perfect question. Uh, uh, shop there chip martin being on there hello caller can you can you go ahead and, and tell the question you were you were assigned and and ask it again well the, the original question that somebody assigned me was what are you going to do with all the puppets that, when you have to move them but that's already been answered huh so so my real question is what is a tony <laughs> <laughs> It's a guy from Jersey that makes pizzas, puts them in a flat box. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Everybody, this is the 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 Dale Brown calling in. We didn't want to let the broadcast go by without talking with Dale. So, Dale, thanks for being here, buddy. That's okay. Lisa, you're doing a, such a tremendous job, I can't tell you. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Good. It's deal. a cool place to work. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. That was technology at its finest. My cell phone, Dale's voice, great. All right, Lisa. Now, I think you're going to get ready to transition, right, to one of the other buildings? Yeah, yeah. let's go to the last building. All right, so while you're doing that, I'm going to play a couple of the questions, and I'll catch you up on those. So we're going to say goodbye to Lisa and Annie for now, and they're going to transition to the next building, and uh, we'll see you soon. So we've had these questions asked, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I want to play for you a couple of more of the questions that we have from our celebrity asking group questioners. I don't know. I'm having a hard time labeling this. Here's our next question. You all know him. Uh, he is the coach uh, of, of not only uh, one of the winners of America's Got Talent in the United States. He's also a coach of a winner. I know of most recently of an America's Got Talent winner in Spain. Next question comes from Gary Owen. Who lives in the house? We'll do it again. Who lives in the house? So Gary's question is who lives in the house? And if you've been uh, to Vent Haven, you know it is on the grounds of W.S. Burger's home. Uh, and Jeff mentioned that before, that the home is the home of the curator, uh, uh, the current curator at the museum. In this case, it's Lisa and Brian's home and their two daughters and my, my wonderful, wonderful dog friend uh, who uh, you see me post once in a while on Facebook, uh, Zena. But that is a family home on the grounds of Van Haven. 
Uh, and that's who lives in the home is Lisa and her family. Let me have one more question for you. You all know him and love him. Uh, he's from Florida. He's the five foot high marketing guy. And he's the latest addition to the board of advisor members. Here's a question from Jimmy V. Hey, everybody, it's me, Jimmy V, and I'm Dickie Z, world's greatest sales guy. You're the world's greatest sales guy? I am. Well, it's great thing that you're here then, because today we have a question about dummies for the Vent Haven Museum. I resemble that remark. I know you do, but it's perfect that you're here. Here's the question. Do you guys buy and sell dummies? What? I buy, I sell, I'm the best. I know you're the best. Do you have any advice for the people watching? Of course I do. Buy high and sell low. Wait. What? That's our buddy, Jimmy V. Outstanding. All right. I see that Lisa is in front of the next building. And so we're going to ask her that question flat out uh, about buying and selling of the dummies. Here she is. Hi, Lisa. Did you hear that question from Jimmy V? I did. I did. And yes, I get asked all the time, particularly in email. People want to know what's for sale here. And they've seen a dummy sitting and they would like to buy it. So that kind of cracks me up. Uh, we have very limited merchandise available here, but we do not uh, buy dummies and we do not sell dummies. Everything that comes to the collection is donated. And that's been the way it's been, I think, since the early 60s. Once the, once the, uh, once the museum became a nonprofit organization, What's amazing to me is that we don't have to buy anything because the donations just keep coming in. I'm so grateful that people want to have ventriloquists represented here and that the collection continues to grow. Uh, we do have a gift shop, though, and we sell um, we have some Steve Axtell puppets, I think, that I sold out of this year. Thank you very much, Steve. And I've got some Smith Henderson puppets that I also sold out of. So we do have a gift shop for people who want to buy something at the end of the tour. But we absolutely do not buy. We do not sell. We do not lend anything that is part of the Vent Haven collection. Outstanding. All right. A couple more questions I'll ask you before we go inside. We've had a lot of questions come through here. Uh, let me just jump to one very, very quickly. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so many of them coming in. I'm just trying to go back to the earlier ones to get some of these questions in. Um, I thought this was a great question from Melanie Beasley. She wants to know which dummy there is going to protest the demolition. Which one will you expect is going to handcuff themselves at the door? Hell no, we won't go. I got this because Jeff gracefully, graciously did our uh, promo video for us when we started fundraising for the new museum. And if you go on our YouTube channel or our website, you can see that promo video. And it is Walter. It is Walter who says that this is never going to happen. So poo poo magoo to Walter. It is going to happen and you are going to get a new seat. And that's the way it goes. <laughs> that's great. Hey, here's a great question from Karen Olson. Karen says, when I visited Mr. Berger's home in the summer of 1956, I remember about 300 figures lined up on folding chairs in the garage. My grandfather and Mr. Berger were friends for decades. Yes. Do you have an inventory of what was there in 1956 and how many figures were there? in 1956. What a great question, Karen. Thank you for asking that. So Mr. Berger had to file taxes every year, which included an inventory of the dummies. So yes, every year he would write down which dummies had been added to the collection and he would submit that new uh, document to his attorney uh, for his taxes. He would appraise them. And it's really sweet because the appraisal values that he gave, obviously, are, we're much, much smaller than they would appraise for today. But it's a very sweet thing to go through and look at the growth of the collection under Mr. Berger's watch. He also uh, would take little notes about things. And uh, the, the main record, excuse me, is huge. <coughs> but the little, the little inventory, he would have a little notes field. And he'd write something like, you know, needs to be restrung. <laughs> so he was uh, he was always keeping records of all that kind of stuff. Yes. So the answer to it is if the question is, is there a record of it at Vent Haven? The answer is almost always yes. <coughs> water? No, I'm all right. I think. OK. I think he's going to give me some water. Am I still on? Yep. <coughs> You ready to go into the next building? Yeah. I do have one quick question. Uh, and that is, will this video be available <coughs> after? Uh, this is live. Let me give Lisa a chance there to get a drink of water. Okay. I am. Ahead, Lisa. Uh, so the answer to, for Terry is that Terry, yes. 
Uh, this will be available to you uh, on the YouTube channels um, uh, for uh, my own personal, as well as we're going to put it up on Venthaven. We'll download it and upload it onto that channel. Also, uh, all the, the ventriloquist uh, associations and groups that you have on, on, uh, on Facebook, this will live on those channels as well. Uh, and then it'll be up to uh, Brian and Lisa to figure out if they're going to put it on the Venthaven uh, website itself. So yeah, that it's going to be around for a bit. We've had some questions too about um, the future building. We're not going to really address um, that the future building uh, all that much uh, because we're going to do another uh, broadcast about that later. So we will answer those uh, for you. N uh, uh, Nyla Summers, we did answer how they're clean. So thanks for that. Doug Prize, good question. Could the uh, Wences arm be longer? I don't know if that's tongue in cheek or if we can extend it, but we'll ask that for Lisa when she comes back. I think she's ready to go. Give me the thumbs up, Lisa, if you're ready. All right, good deal. Lisa is back. So Doug Prize, I, he's asking, can the Wences arm be longer? I think it's tongue in cheek, but how, how long is that arm? Is it is it overly long? I didn't really notice. Of the arm? My arm? Yeah. The Wences. Oh, Wences yeah. It's kind of long, yeah. yeah. It's a little bit disproportionate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that thing, okay. the Wences, that was made by uh, Leonardo. He was a competitor of oh, Wences. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a little awkward, but it does work. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. 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 Good deal. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go ahead and take us inside the next building. All right. So this is our last building for the tour. This building will be uh, will remain after construction. This one in the Jimmy Nelson building will still be here for you to see. Uh, this building that we're going into is the Josephine Berger Memorial Building. Mr. Berger built it in the early 60s and dedicated to his wife, Josephine, when she passed away in 67. Uh, this, he set it up that he wanted it to be uh, primarily a discussion about figure making. And so the dummies today are still seated primarily by who made them rather than by who used them. So let's go on in. The first thing that I do upon coming into the building, though, is finish the timeline. Uh, we run out of space in the W.S. Berger building to do the timeline of the names that everyone typically recognizes. And so I finish uh, the timeline first, which is to talk about Darcy Lynn Farmer and her incredible contribution to the art form. Uh, my favorite Darcy Lynn story is that right after she won America's Got Talent, I started having an influx of a lot of kids' tours including one day a Girl Scout troop, which was adorable. And they were just all these little kids, you know, and they were huge fans of Darcy's. And this little girl looked at me and she was so sincere. I was, I was talking about Darcy and oh, she's phenomenal in her skills and her singing and her puppetry, la, 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 la. And this little girl was so sincere and she said, she's not just doing puppets. She's not even moving her lips. <laughs> and she was so serious thinking that Darcy Lynn Farmer had invented ventriloquism. It was adorable. It was adorable. It was, you know, it was new to her. And so Darcy must have invented it. It's been so great having a, a young ventriloquist like Darcy out there in the public eye. It has caused many, many more children to take up ventriloquism, many, many more kids coming to the convention to try Many, many more being in Junior Vent University. And, you know, and she couldn't be any nicer. Darcy and her parents are just some of the nicest people I've ever known. And we're so grateful for their involvement with the museum, their support of the museum. And then all of these wonderful things that they contributed to Vent Haven so that her fans can come here and be thrilled that there's a Petunia and an Oscar here. So it's That's been incredible. great. It's been so great to have um, this exhibit for, for fans of Darcy's to see. Do you know, do you know how great Darcy is Lisa? I do. Yeah. Let's get a question for you from Darcy Lynn Farmer. Here what? She is. what do the neighbors think? <laughs> Darcy wants to know what the neighbors think of all this. What activity. Are the neighbors think? I really get asked that quite a bit actually, because you know, you don't, I think there's going to be a museum back here. I have people just drive right by and our little sign in the yard, our cute little sign, they still catch it. Uh, the museum has been here longer than any of the neighbors. So when they come in, we meet them and say, hey, by the way, this place exists and we have people visit. We're very quiet and the tours are, it's not like we're a rock and roll museum and we've got, you know, 
electric guitars plugged in and playing out in the yard. People love living near us, actually. All of our neighbors have endorsed our construction project and signed off on that and vouched for us at city council meetings and things like that. We really pride ourselves on contributing to the community of Fort Mitchell and to our street, West Maple in particular. We've had events, we've had open houses. We were specifically asking the neighbors to come. So our neighbors are the best neighbors. Go West Maple, Ooh, yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Next on the tour are the soft figures for the most part. There's a lot of variety in here. And, uh, you know, generally when people think of puppets, a lot of them will think of these Muppet type uh, adorable faces. They're very friendly faces here. And so they respond to these very well. One question I get asked often is what is the biggest dummy in the collection? And that's this one here, Reuben Hick Hickory. He's six foot six when he's standing. And we actually did a behind the scenes video of Ruben. So when people ask about him, I direct them to that video on our website and on our YouTube channel where you can see him out and about and his whole story told as well. I love the soft figures. Uh, nobody's ever intimidated by them. Nobody has ever creeped out about them. And it's a great time in the tour to talk about why not. Because earlier in the tour, they would have said that they were creeped out by the dummies because of them being human. But as you can see, we have a lot of these soft puppets that are clearly human characters and not animals. So what is it about that? And it leads to a great discussion of the uncanny valley and the role of, of eye contact and primate behavior and all kinds of great discussions about why we respond to traditional dummies in a different way than we do to the soft puppets. Back here on the back wall are all kinds of toys and novelty items, things that have been mass produced uh, to a large degree. I have people who ask about Howdy Doody, of course. And when I talk to them about that, they realize quickly that Howdy Doody has nothing to do with ventriloquism, but Howdy Doody was popular at the same time as these big ventriloquists of the mid 20th century were. So they have a connection in their mind. Of course, that doesn't stop a toy company from making a ventriloquism doll, uh, even though the real Howdy Doody has nothing to do with uh, ventriloquism directly. The same thing goes for W.C. Fields and Laurel and Hardy and Mo Howard and um, Bozo the Clown and Raggedy Ann and Mickey Mouse. Toy companies will make a doll about anybody that will say, let's make a doll. So these characters um, serve kind of kind of have a cross marketing um, appeal there. On this side of the room, the dummies in each row are seated by figure maker. And so this gives me a great time to talk about various styles of figure making. One in particular that gets a lot of attention here is Lynn Ensel, starting with Ensel boy head here in the tan outfit. And then moving down this row, I ask people to look at the similarities of those faces and tell me what they're seeing. Of course, arts, artists uh, have a style and Len Ensel's is very uh, easy to kind of peg once you examine a few of his pieces. A very, uh, one of my favorite figure makers, I think he's Austin Phillips' favorite figure maker. I don't think I'm going on a limb there if you've seen any of Austin's work. And so what I do here now is compare the traditional wooden card dummy, which of course we have tons and tons of those and how the slot jaw mouth works. And that's a great traditional figure with how Len Insel did it. So Len worked with paper mache and leather. And so the mouth doesn't have that slot jaw up and down, neck cracker kind of look. In fact, the lips tend to fold down and you get a much more natural look to that. Hey. Hi, Anne. Hi, Austin. Great little piece here. And then the eyes moving. One thing I will say to you guys that uh, I do in the regular tour is I warn them. They have not seen anybody's eyes move at this point. And so when, before I move the eyes, I say, I'm getting ready to move this guy's eyes. So there you go. Eyes moving. Great little piece, though, isn't it? Uh, this had some damage a few years ago, uh, and it uh, had to be repaired. And the uh, we, we got Austin Phillips to do that repair for us because he's so such a talented figure maker and so familiar with uh, Insul's work. And, of course, it is uh, perfect because it's Austin. So thank you, Austin, for that repair work you did for us so that we can use this as a demonstrator piece in the, uh, in the tours. Thank you. Next up are the presidents. So everybody loves the presidents. Everybody loves the presidents. When they walk in, a lot of people go straight over here and just look at these amazing dummies. 
These were made by a figure maker named John Butler, who was friends with Jim Teeter, the ventriloquist who used them. Many of you remember Jim. Jim did political humor starting in 1960 uh, during the Kennedy administration while he was in college in Oklahoma. And he found that the presidential humor uh, got more laughs than his traditional ventriloquism act. And that's why he transitioned over into doing uh, just political humor. So when, when Kennedy was assassinated, he put that dummy away and he made his own dummy of Lyndon Johnson out of a Halloween mask. But it wasn't a very he wasn't very pleased with it. And so it, it just wasn't a, you know, a good quality piece in his mind. So when Johnson said he wasn't going to run again, he wouldn't accept the nomination. Uh, Jim just happened to be in a conversation with John Butler talking about that. And what am I going to do? And how am I going to how am I going to get a cool dummy? Uh, because I obviously can't make it very well. So John says, you pick who's going to win the election and I'll make you the dummy. And so that relationship lasted for all of these administrations. Uh, Jim retired from ventriloquism in uh, 2006 during George W's administration. And in 2016, uh, Jim brought all of the dummies up here to Vent Haven. My favorite part of that was that at some point in his journey, he stopped the car and he got them out of their cases and buckled them into the car for me to see. So he pulls into the <laughs> Vent Haven driveway and knocks on the door. He's like, yo, they're here. And I go outside expecting to, you know, get trunks out of his, out of his trunk. And they're all in the car. And I open, I take these great pictures of him with these dummies just sitting there looking up at me. It was adorable. We got these dummies like on, let's say on a Thursday. And we were going to have an open house that Saturday. I had no time to make an exhibit for him. Just no time at all to get ready. So we went, we just got real creative and we put them all in the dining room of the house. We used, we converted the dining room over so it was a conference table with all the presidents sitting around and had the, we let the people come into the house to see them in the dining room. But I didn't want people just walking around the house during an open house. So Brian, my husband, if you've met him, who is always up for anything and a very funny guy, he dressed up like a secret service agent and he stood at the back steps with his little earpiece in and his sunglasses on and his suit and he would bring people in and escort them and act like a Secret Service agent, serving two purposes there of protecting the dummies, protecting the house, and, of course, adding a lot of humor to the day. So thank you to my husband, Brian, for his willingness to go along with that. I think it might have been his idea, actually. So not just go along with it, but think of something that funny to do. You know, Lisa, I just have to throw this out here, too. Brian is a funny guy in so many ways, and he's also one of the unsung heroes. He does so much for the museum. And we just love him. So I'm just going to throw that in there. I agree. He said he had, you know, the, the different things that we have succeeded at here in Ben Haven. So much of that is Brian behind the scenes, making sure that it works. He's on tech support for me right now yeah. out there making sure the signal doesn't drop and all of that. Yeah. yeah. And he doesn't, he doesn't want any credit at all for anything that he does, which makes it even better. You know, he's just so easy to work with and, yeah, Ben Haven wouldn't be where it is today without Brian's help. So no, I know, you know Brian. Really want to appreciate him he's, so much. Yeah, he's, he's the a best. Good guy. He yeah, really he is. is. Thanks. Good. Our next section here, these are the, the uh, Mac and Marshall dummies, quite a few of the ones that we have in the collection. Uh, I, when I'm talking to general tourists, I'm like, these are your brothers and sisters with Charlie McCarthy. So the original Charlie McCarthy, of course, was made in the workshop of Theo Mac and Son. Uh, of course, Frank Marshall took credit for it later on in a number of sources, but anybody that's really studying the timeline knows that, that Frank came along a little bit after that, and he didn't actually make Charlie, so it's kind of sweet. But it didn't stop him from saying it. And, of course, um, Marshall gets the shot eventually uh, after the Macs are gone. There was an interim there where another man owned the shop. There are people who think, and we even thought at one point, that the interim man there, Alex Cameron, made dummies, but we don't really have any evidence of that. So we we were waiting to get definitive evidence before we assert that anymore. Uh, Frank, though, was the, one of the most prolific American figure makers, and his work is just highly treasured by collectors, great quality pieces. Uh, Frank May, Danny O'Day, and Farful for Jimmy Nelson. Uh, Frank May, Jerry Mahoney for Paul Winchell. He was the go-to guy, uh, particularly in the Ed Sullivan era of, um, of, of ventriloquism. He was the guy people wanted to get um, their dummy from. So Frank is just an extraordinary, was an extraordinary figure maker uh, for American figure. 
Yeah, we had a question before, Lisa. Someone said, how do they get a, uh, a Marshall repaired? There are a couple of people out there. Um, yeah. uh, you mentioned Austin Phillips, uh, Tyler Ellis. And also yeah. I want to point out, too, that one of the gentlemen that allows us to broadcast uh, on his channel, his group, uh, which is Conrad Hartz, still carves the way Frank Marshall carved. Uh, and uh, he's, he's been greatly uh, inspired by Frank Marshall. So just important to point out that there are some contemporary folks out there that absolutely positively also honor the great Frank Marshall. Yes. Yeah. All right. As we're coming to watch out, Annie, there you go. Almost backed into the bench. Thank you. Um, as we're coming to the end of the tour, the last thing that I do is typically talk about the McElroy brothers. Uh, they were from Harrison, Ohio. And so the local connection there is uh, common for a lot of my tourists. They're, they're local a lot, a lot of times. So talk about Harrison, Ohio and the significance of that with regard to ventriloquism history. Two brothers named George and Glenn McElroy uh, made dummies from 1936 to 1941. And their dummies are incredibly complex. Uh, we talk about that the lack of need of a complex dummy. Charlie McCarthy didn't even have moving eyes. You think about Jeff Dunham's Walter, he has eyebrows and a mouth, and that's it. It's not about a complex dummy to be a great ventriloquist, but they surely are cool to look at. So, yes, for I guess it was Peter Valentin who wanted to see Cecil. Here I go, Peter. Here I go. I'm going to give Peter a shout out real quick just because he's supported our adopt a dummy program. Not once, not twice, but three times. He's a huge McElroy fan. Peter adopted uncle Eddie and Peter adopted Johnny and Peter adopted Diddy talk Hawkins. So thank you very much, Peter, for that support. I know you're a huge, huge fan of the McElroys like so many others. All right. So this is Cecil. Yay. This is Cecil Wigglenose. He was made in 1937. So he's kicking it being 84 years old. Uh, the McElroy brothers didn't use the traditional eyes. They used ping pong balls that they would paint for the eyes. And in several of their figures, they installed the eyes and the eyebrows uh, with a counterweight in the head so that I'm not using any mechanical energy. I'm just using gravity. Hello. To get him to look all around the room. Yay. Of course, his mouth works. You would expect that. And his upper lip, nice smile. Look at that, Cecil. And in addition to that, he's got six more features. A tourist love this guy. So wiggling ears, crossing eyes, winking, cool, and sticking out his tongue, sniffing his nose. And then my favorite, my favorite piece here, and this is for my friend Tom Ladshaw, the fright wig. Wow! I love the fright wig, cracks me up. Uh, I also show uh, everybody the mechanism here on Cecil. Traditional head stick here with the primary mouth controls, lower jaw here, upper jaw here. And we talk about the development of this system of controls that they did. It's really amazing when you think about the, the engineering that's going on inside the head, the complexity of the rods and all of the different pieces that are in there. And people love looking at that. Uh, the McElroys didn't make very many dummies. They're not, they weren't extremely prolific like Frank Marshall was. They, they made less than four dozen. And there's probably still a few out there that are still undiscovered. So I always encourage people, if you see a dummy and it's got a string coming out of the back of the head, that's kind of cool. If you see a dummy and you got to stick your hand in there to operate it, that's even cooler. If you see a dummy and it's got ping pong balls that are lolling around in its head, would you go ahead and bring that to Vent Haven and let me check that out? <laughs> <laughs> We're very, very fortunate to have so many uh, McElroy figures. Part of that, I think, is the geography of it in that Mr. Berger uh, living here in Fort Mitchell was only 40 minutes away probably a little bit longer in the day, but 40 minutes away from Harrison. So he was able to have these great relationships with the brothers and uh, get them to do work for him. So that is the, the story there. Do I have some more questions, Al? Well, you do. And uh, I'm trying to balance. We just got a late one that came in, but um, I want to, uh, you know, talk about the building that you haven't mentioned yet. And yeah. this question is, the most beautifully asked question. Uh, I think you'll find out why uh, when I play this next question. Okay. okay. Hello, this is a live and totally unrehearsed, certainly not edited at all question to the curator. Miss Lisa, what's in the Jimmy Nelson building? Oh, 
Oh, Jay, Jay, Jay. You know I love you. Thank you so much. You're so creative. You're so awesome. You're so sweet to me. I just, I love you so much. And I appreciate that you would go to that effort to ask a question about the Jimmy <laughs> Nelson building. Yes, on most tours, I tell people we're going to go into three buildings. And they always ask, what's in the Jimmy Nelson building? So I don't typically take tourists in there because it's typically a special exhibit about a ventriloquist from our community, a special exhibit of some type. But then a lot of times I'm using it just for storage uh, while I'm putting an exhibit together or something like that. So uh, because it's you, Jay, we'll go in there and you're going to kind of see the mix of what's actually in there. If you were here this summer, which I know you were, Jay, you know that we received the uh, donation from the Nelson family of of Danny and Farfel and Patanatita and Humphrey, those are still there. But in addition to that, because I'm starting to load up tomorrow, the room is also filled with uh, with storage tubs. So if you want to see that, we can go see that. What do you think, Al? Should we go see that? I would say let's definitely go see that um, because it gives me another minute to download these videos. <laughs> But, you know, I have to go back to Darcy's question while I was walking around. What do the neighbors think? <laughs> yeah, what do they yeah. think? I think, you, I think you should definitely go see that because Jay did such a great job uh, asking that. So while you're walking over there, I'm going to uh, take you off the screen for a second as you set up All that right. next shot. And um, we have a couple of more questions that are coming our way. In fact, um, to tell you how we do these live streams, they're very much up to the minute. Uh, and so uh, I'm actually going to play one um, for um, for Lisa here that just came in. One of my uh, favorite, favorite guys uh, who's, who's going to ask this question. I'll bring him on in one second. Uh, but for those of you that are asking questions, really, really appreciate it. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in. We're going to do our best to try to get a bunch answered here in a bit. We're about 35 minutes over our initial target goal. So just know that um, we did want to try to wrap up here in about an hour. <laughs> that didn't work. Sometimes, you know, you have special guests show up and things like that. Um, but I'll tell you what, here is our next question, literally hot off the press from a guy that inspired me so much over the years. When I was convention chair back in the day and we had different people that chaired the convention, I wanted to make sure that he joined us on stage and he did. And he blew the doors off the place. Here's a question from my friend, Jim Barber. Excuse me, I have a question. Who was that one ventriloquist on that one show? <laughs> uh, Lisa? It's legit. Lisa, I know. Tell us about that question. Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. It happens all the time. People can't, when they're, especially when the tour is getting started, they know they know something about somebody, but the name isn't right there on the top. And so I have to kind of like look at the wrinkles in their face and say, well, now are you older than me or younger than me? And what show and what did the <laughs> puppet look like right now? I want to give a, I want to give a shout out to Dan Horn right now because of this very question. Uh, Dan on our board of advisors, traveling control because that's cruise ships. I had yeah. tourists just the other day who had been on a cruise and they said, oh, we heard about Vent Haven from a ventriloquist on a cruise ship. And I said, what was his name? And they said, oh, I don't I don't I don't, I don't remember the name. This was like two years ago. And I said, OK, what did he do? And he goes, oh, well, then he remembers. Well, he had this old man puppet and he had this hearing aid issue and he kept shaking when he would adjust the hearing aid. People remember the puppet. They remember the character. So, Dan, thank you for the shout out on the cruises. I know you did that frequently. But, yeah, so what was that one guy that did that one thing on that one show is like a question I have to deal with all the time. And I have to prompt people for the smallest little bit of information about that to try to suss out what they're asking me. <laughs> you know, you just shook a memory that I'd, I'd just forgotten about. My my dad's finest moment and my, my, my aunts as well who was with him. They were in line to go see Sammy King in Las Vegas. And while we were in line, some lady said, we just saw a ventriloquist in Atlantic City last week talking to each other. And she described the ventriloquist. And my aunt went, oh, that's my nephew. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so oh, that's that so was cool. my dad's, you know, favorite moment ever in his life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Are All you right, ready to go in the Jimmy Nelson building? Yeah, let's go. Let's play that beautiful video 
One more time. You ready? Here we go. Hello, this is a live and totally unrehearsed, certainly not edited at all question to the curator. Miss Lisa, what's in the Jimmy Nelson building? Take it away, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I wish I could play the piano and accompany myself in the answer. Uh, here I am with Buddy, the cat that keeps the mice away. Hello, Buddy. Uh, here we are at the Jimmy Nelson building. Uh, this building was actually named after Jimmy Nelson in 2011. Prior to that, we called it the Ship Building. But our entire uh, 2011 convention was a tribute to Jimmy and his 70 years in ventriloquism. So it was a huge celebration. And one of the things that the board of directors did was uh, ask him to be the dean of American ventriloquists and to um, dedicate this building to him. I want to give uh, all the credit for how that convention was run as far as all the Jimmy Nelson stuff is going to Tom Ladshaw. It was his idea and he came up with all of the ways that he wanted to honor uh, Jimmy and he made, he wrote a book, he did all of this stuff. So Tom, I know that that made Jimmy's career for you to do that for him. It was the best convention. It was so much fun. Um, I know you had to work with Mark on that and Mark, thank you so much for going along and doing all of those things. Um, but it really, I think, especially now that Jimmy's gone. I think that, that that people were here for the 2011 convention. I have that memory to cling to about what a tremendous time it was to honor him while he was still here and could um, receive all those hugs and those accolades and all of those well wishes. So uh, we'll go on in here and we'll see the stuff, but you're gonna see both sides of the Venhaven Haven coin. So don't judge me people, come on in. So here is the Jimmy Nelson exhibit. When uh, when the Nelsons gave us everything on, I believe it was Thursday night of the convention, I uh, brought everything back and we set it up very simply for people to um, to see and to come and visit. So uh, Tom stayed out here, I believe, with everything and visited. And we have pictures of Betty and the kids out here. So it was lovely to have them. This is probably the most significant donation that's ever going to come in. Um, and... Um, and it's the one that none of us wanted to get. So if you've ever met Jimmy, you understand. Um, you understand. He was the best. And then, like I said, there's another side to this, to this building, <laughs> and that is storage. I'm getting ready to start uh, tomorrow with the um, with the storage of the dummies. And so I had to get all the containers and, and all of that a staging area. So we've got merch out here and tubs and things to get ready to put things away. So that's very behind the scenes for you. All right, Lisa, um, would you like me to ask another question while you're while you're walking? Yes. What is it? All right. Ask another question. Yeah, go ahead. All right. We'll ask another question. Let me bring on um, our um, the person you just mentioned, in fact, and thanked. Here is our convention chair, Mr. Mark huh? Wade. Hey, Lisa. Hi, it's Mark Wade here, your executive director for the convention. I've got a question for you. How big is the Van Haven collection? Don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yes, we get asked about that all the time. Uh, there's currently 1,020 dummies and puppets in the collection. About 800 of them are on exhibit right now. But in addition to that, it is truly a, um, an iceberg collection. There are hundreds and hundreds of posters, playbills, scripts, recordings, costumes, uh, photographs, at least at least 10,000 eight by tens here. And we're working in every off season to make more and more of that digitally available. But it is a it is a project for the ages. I, I can't imagine I could stay here 50 years and work and it will not all be digitized. So it's it's a huge collection. We do, though, hope to share more of it with you in the new building, uh, show you more dimensions of what is here rather than just dummies and photographs. We hope to share more of the ephemera with uh, the public, with the ventriloquism community. And we hope to give you a, a better understanding of how much work W.S. Berger did in amassing this collection. How'd you get this job? Did I get a question? How'd I get this job? Is that the That's question? The, question. Now? the person wants to know how you got a job like this, Lisa. No kidding. Right. Right. 
So <laughs> the story is uh, long, but I will shorten it since we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I learned of the museum when I was a teacher. I taught math, high school math, with the lovely and talented Annie Roberts at a local high school out here at Lloyd High School in Erlanger, Kentucky, which is where um, the airport is. That's kind of that town. And I learned about the museum from her. She was the curator before me. And I learned about it when she was looking to start a family and build a home. She was looking for a replacement. And I didn't know anything about Vent Haven. And I said, what museum about ventriloquism? So I came out here in the winter of 99, Brian and I came here and were just overwhelmed, right? By the size of this collection and the coolness of it, the uniqueness of it. So we moved in in uh, May of 2000 was when I started working for the museum. Uh, and of course, Annie's on the board of directors. I'm on the board of directors now. But um, man, those first couple of years were something because when I got here, all I knew was I knew who Willie Tyler and Lester were. I knew who Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop were. And I knew who Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy were. Now, I didn't know anything about them, but I just recognized them. So I've had to learn all of the ventriloquism uh, from reading and researching. But I mean, serious, serious, serious thanks. We know this. If I don't say it, everybody else knows it anyway. Very serious thanks to Tom Latshaw for his massive willingness to educate me and especially those first 10, 15, wait, we're going on 21 years of education from Tom. So thank you, Tom. I like to throw my mistakes back at him. So if I've said anything incorrect tonight, it's Tom's fault. He told me that that's the way it was. So I'm just kidding. So, well, yeah. what, a little known fact is Tom makes it all up anyway. So, yeah. it's <laughs> but it's funny because in my, in my interview with John Brooking, who was president at the time, Annie's dad was president at the time. My first interview question was, are you a ventriloquist? And of course, the truth is no, not at all. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get this job. I thought it was a prerequisite. <laughs> but in fact, Mr. Berger did not want a ventriloquist to work here. And because of that, uh, they were checking to see if I was qualified to work here. And the no was the right answer, not the yeah. wrong answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. It'd be a problem. You'd be out there every night playing with all the puppets, right? We have so many compliments, Lisa. Uh, David Overby says, great tour. Thanks for your hard work. Uh, OK Jones says, thank you. I love that, his name, by the way. Thanks for doing this. What a wonderful place. Um, don't forget the many letters saved by Mr. Berger. Lisa sent me scans of about 200 pages of letters. This is from Karen between my grandfather and Mr. Berger. And you've showed me that, Lisa. He had such a filing system. Absolutely, positively amazing. Um, I, I, I had a question here, and they're coming in so fast and furious. I'm trying to get back to Andy Gross's question. This is a great question. Uh, I'm sure I missed it. I joined late, but when will the new building be done? This is a great spot to ask this question. Uh, for the, the next convention, done. that fast question mark? Well, we're hoping that's what the contractor said. Uh, the new building is going to be so cool. It will have um, handicapped accessibility. It'll have handicapped parking, parking in the back for a limited number of cars, but parking and I know if you've been here before, you, you don't even have any idea how excited I am that I'm never going to have to say, please let the members of your group know that we don't have any restrooms. There will be restrooms. Yeah, well, it's, it's, funny so that you, it's funny you say that. Tyler Ellis, one of our one of our figure makers in our in our uh, our community, says, Lisa, what are you most excited about with the new facility? I think you just <laughs> asked the question. Is there a room? There's two of them or a design feature that you're looking forward to the most? And, uh, you know, we're hoping to scrape up the money to make those the Al Gettler toilets. That's the hope. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, I'm very, I'm so much about it. I mean, basically, we got into the idea, the vision of building a new building when we examined the obstacles that already exist. So yeah. moving people from one building to another, especially when it's raining, that's not very much fun for them. Right. And not having restrooms, not having much seating, having the dummies being so crowded together. Uh, all of those things have really kind of limited us. So. When we decided we wanted to build, our first focus is, was on removing obstacles and making it a more comfortable experience for our tourists and way, way better for the health of the collection here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Lisa, it's up to you. We are at, let's see, 149. So it's time for the last question. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it? the last question. Here's the last question. I'm going to play it twice because it's kind of fast. All right. And maybe you want to look at the camera with Annie so you can actually see okay. the screen. You ready? Okay, I'm looking. Uh -huh. right, here we go. 
Do you know Jeff Dunham? Do you, do you? <laughs> we'll play, oh my God. We'll play it one more time. Do you know Jeff Dunham? Do you, do you? <laughs> okay, that's I a love that one. one. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, it looks like oh they were all God. dressed up to go to Audrey's birthday dinner yesterday and uh, it was so great of them to do that. And then, of course, Jeff uh, joined us today, which was really, really That nice. is awesome. Hi, Jack. Yeah. Hi, Jim. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, Audrey. I'm sorry Jeff had to do something for us on your birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Daniel, uh, da Jan Daniel and Jerry, thanks so much. We appreciate that. Lori says great tour. Uh, please, so cute. Uh, Phil Nichols, um, uh, long one there, but uh, yeah, uh, your puppets will live on at Vent Haven. So true. Uh, Karen, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Well, um, Jay Johnson gets the last word. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Al, Annie, Brian, Lisa Sweezy. Onward and upward. Wow, what a way to close it out right there. Yes, Al, thank you so much for hosting this and taking care of everything on your end. I really appreciate it. It's made it so easy for us. Thank you to ABR for camera work and to my darling husband over here on tech support. Thank you, dear. Come on, camera. Come on, Annie. Get Where him on, on camera. camera. Where's Adam? He's so humble. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Making sure Great the signal job. stays up. Thank Great you, Al. And thank you, everybody, so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to share with you the progress of the, the move out and the demolition and the construction. And I can't wait for you guys to be here uh, to see the brand new facility. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Folks, thank you all for being here tonight. We appreciate it for joining this live stream. Again, I'll repeat, the live stream will be available once we finish here in a moment. You can go ahead and watch it from the very beginning. It'll be on the channels for, for some time, you know, for the next few weeks. And we'll, uh, we'll keep you up to speed uh, where it'll be after that. But uh, this is the last Event Haven tour. It really is sad. And uh, someone says here, time for Skyline Chili. So true, <laughs> Joseph Franklin, uh, Jim Barber, woo-woo. Uh, Lisa, stick around. I'm going to end the broadcast now, folks. Thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summer, and we'll see you next summer, hopefully at a brand new Vent Haven building.